Chapter 8. William walked slowly through the house up to the attic. It would probably take Mrs. Phillips a while to get used to her new arrangement, and he wasn't quite ready to face her. He could barely hear the rise and fall of small voices inside the belt pack. He hoped Sir Simon was doing a good job of explaining the situation to her. He sat down on the top step and waited. The knight was the first to stick his head out. Where are we? he asked. Back in the attic, William replied. He put his hand down, palm outstretched, and Sir Simon scrambled onto it. Then the knight turned to help Mrs. Phillips. Come on, my lady, he called into the darkness of the belt pack. No need to be afraid. Young William has a remarkably steady hand. Looking down, William saw her emerge slowly. First the top of her head, the straight white hair rumpled from the trip. Then her small arms, still holding her blue raincoat, and finally her small feet in their practical brown walking shoes. Although she'd only known Sir Simon for one short bumpy ride, she seemed to trust him already. She allowed him to steady her and nodded wearily when he asked her a question in a low voice. Hold still, the knight snapped at William. I understand that you've explained nothing to her at all. She's quite shaken. I'm going to go in for her suitcase. I'm holding as still as I can, William muttered. While the small knight fished around for her case, his legs tickled William's palm. She stood without moving or turning around. William looked down at her, but didn't call out. Small as she now was, she was still Mrs. Phillips, and he could see she was disappointed by the curve of her shoulders. Sir Simon inched his way back onto the platform of William's hand, pulling the suitcase behind him. Let's go to the castle, William. I would like to show Lady Eleanor her accommodations. She already knows where they are, William said, smiling at the knight, who seemed to have lost ten years in the last hour. Ah, oh, but not from the inside, the knight replied. William lowered the drawbridge and lifted the portcullis for them. Sir Simon helped his companion off William's hand and escorted her across the wooden planks of the bridge, talking and gesturing all the while. When they disappeared around the corner of the outer wall, William lay down on his stomach and waited by the, for them by the entrance. They reappeared from time to time, now at the door of the chapel, now in the front tower. When he saw them head across the courtyard to the kitchen, he lifted the roof off the second floor and watched them come out from the staircase into the master chamber. Mrs. Phillips leaned her head close to the knights, listening intently to all he had to say. She seemed at home with Sir Simon, which William knew should make him happy. But it didn't. It made him feel oddly lonely. He sat up so his face was the right height and distance from theirs. Do you like it, Miss Phillips? he asked when he saw that the knight had at last come to the end of a sentence. She stared at him. It was the look of one person trying to recognize another after a long separation. Then she whispered something to Sir Simon and walked off to the other corner of the room. William, my lady says she will not speak to you until you restore her to her normal size. But, Sir Simon, have you told her we can't do that? William whispered. The knight put up both his hands as if to warn William off. There cannot be too many shocks for her at one time, he said quietly. She thinks this is a temporary solution, situation, and seems resigned to it for the moment. Any further revelations would be most unwise right now. I shall make her some dinner and see that she is settled comfortably. He started to move away. Wait, Sir Simon, William said. Tell her... Tell her I didn't did it because I couldn't stand to have her leave. No, never mind. I'll tell her myself tomorrow. I'm sure she'll speak to me then. He watched the knight escort Mrs. Phillips towards the tower door, hoping that she'd turn and wave goodbye to him. But of course she didn't. When Mrs. Phillips made up her mind about something, she rarely changed it. William switched on the small night lamp next to the castle and went downstairs. He wandered through the house, which was darkening quickly with the setting sun. He stopped at the door of Mrs. Phillips' room. It felt empty, although the smell of her lavender soap lingered in the air. He sat in her chair and looked out her window for a long time, watching the swallows swoop and dip over the lawn in the last evening light of the day. Remember, she isn't gone, he said. I still got her with me, upstairs. William, is that you? Called a voice from the end of the hall. William jumped up. Dad? His father met him at the door. It's me. I came home a little early. Has she left? Yes, William said. 
He pushed past his father. Well, let's go downstairs. It's too dark and creepy up here. They cooked their favorite meal for dinner that night. William pressed out the waffles with the old black iron, and his father stirred chopped green peppers and Tabasco sauce into an omelet. It was an odd combination of tastes, but over the years, they'd gotten used to it. Was it hard when Miss Phillips left? His father asked as they sat together at the kitchen table. William nodded. He pretended to concentrate on the maple syrup, filling each separate waffle square before he went on to the next. I'm going to try and get home earlier on the nights your mother has evening hours so we can have dinner together. We'll have to expand our repertoire, though, his father said with a smile. Well, we still have our pot roast with currant jelly, William reminded him, and our chicken soup with bacon bits, but those things take a long time. What are you thinking about, Dad? You got the funny look on your face. I thought we'd try Chinese. Chinese? His father handed William a package from under the table. It's an early birthday, late goodbye, Mrs. Phillips present for me. Go ahead and open it. It was a funny-shaped metal bowl with a Chinese cookbook and two sets of chopsticks inside. William laughed. Most fathers give their sons footballs. His father frowned. Well, I'm not most fathers and you're not most sons. It's a wok, a special pan for stir-frying Chinese food. We can pick out the recipe the night before and all buy the food on the way home from the office. You won't forget? William asked. This was a fair question. His father was easily distracted. You can call and remind me. All right, it's a deal. William started leafing through the book. For Thursday night, let's do beef and broccoli. They washed the dishes and put them away. William spread his homework out on the big table in the living room and worked to the blare of Vivaldi's trumpets. His father loved music. Whenever he was home, there was music playing in all the rooms on an elaborate speaker system he'd installed himself. Been meaning to get to the attic and measure that castle so I can make the moat, his father said as William headed up the stairs to bed. Uh, that's, that's all right, Dad, William said nervously. Mrs. Phillips and the Silver Knight would have no warning. The castle doesn't really need a moat. You just think I'm going to give up this project the way I have some of the others. I don't know, Dad. I know how busy you are with everything. His father smiled and went back to reading the newspaper without a word. William got into bed without checking on the Lord and Lady in the attic. He pretended he didn't want to wake them, but he knew that underneath, he just couldn't face her disapproval again. I'm sure she'll change her mind by tomorrow, he said out loud to nobody. Finally, he fell asleep, but the solid lump of his old bear pushed comfortingly against the lump in his stomach.